Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. I do want to encourage you as you make your travel plans to remember johnnydollarair.com. johnnydollarair.com is a Priceline affiliate link. So when you make your purchase through johnnydollarair.com, part of the purchase price goes to support the great detectives of old time radio at no additional cost to you. So remember when making your travel plans, check johnnydollarair.com first. Well, now it is time for this week's episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. The original air date is August the 18th, 1953, and the title is The Isabel James Matter. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. John Old Maynard, Johnny. Oh, hello, Mr. Maynard. Haven't talked to you in a long time. Want to go to work? Sure. What is it? We insure a Miss Isabel James, Tulsa, Oklahoma. She's been killed. How? Murdered. Like you to leave as soon as you can, Johnny. Won't take me long. See you at your office in an hour and you can fill me in on the details. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund in another adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. For refreshing taste, plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. When your mouth and throat feel hot and dry, a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint gives you quick, long-lasting refreshment. The lively, full-bodied Spearmint flavor cools your mouth and freshens your taste. The chewing itself helps keep your throat pleasantly moist. Best of all, you can chew and enjoy refreshing Wrigley's Spearmint Gum almost any time and any place. Keep a package handy right in your purse or pocket so you can chew a stick whenever you want it. For refreshing taste plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Millions enjoy it, and you will too. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, National Life and Casualty Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Isabel James matter. Expense account item one, $103.65, plain fare and incidentals between Hartford and Tulsa, Oklahoma, after receiving from you the necessary information concerning the case. I arrived in Tulsa the next morning, registered at the hotel and went directly to the police station where I introduced myself to Captain Clifford Kissig. Yeah, got a teletype from your company. Said you'd be in this morning. Good trip? Fine. You're investigating the Isabel James murder. That's right. I was hoping you could give me some help. I'd sure like to, but it's got us stumped. We've had three others like this already. Three others? Yeah, all the same. Isabel James was the fourth. Looks like Tulsa's got a Jack the Ripper. All with their throats cut? Yeah, four killings in the last three weeks. You're after a madman. Yeah, pretty smart madman. Haven't got a lead. Not a one? Always picks a lonely spot, never a witness, never anyone who saw anything or heard anything. What's he use, a knife? The lab thinks it's a razor, straight razor. Got the town a little jumpy. I can understand. But we'll get something. Sooner or later, the killer will make a slip or somebody will tell us something. What happens in the meantime? We just got to pray there ain't no more killing. Hmm. How far is Dawson from Tulsa? Not very far. Going over to see the dead girl's uncle. Yeah, he's the beneficiary. Mm -hmm. I found the policy in her belongings. I was the one notified your company. You know the uncle? Had him come down and identify the body. Uh, How much does he get? Ten thousand. Well, he can use it. Just an old farmer. Well, I'm going to run over and see him. All right. Uh, how long are you going to be in town? Well, I'm being paid to investigate a murder. I guess I'll be around until somebody catches a killer. (laughs) 
Captain Kissig advised me where I could rent a car, and a half hour later I was driving a small coupe out of the Tulsa city limits heading for Dawson. The dead girl's uncle, Morley Parrish, lived a few miles east of Dawson in an old rundown farmhouse that was in the middle of six or eight acres of parched earth. He was a man in his late fifties, weather worn and thin. He met me at the door with a look of suspicion. What do you want? Mr. Parrish? Yes. My name is Dollar. I represent the insurance company that covered your niece's life. I'd like to talk to you about it. About what? About your niece. Her death. She's dead. What's there to talk about? You're the beneficiary. You got ten thousand dollars from the insurance company. Come in. <clears throat> Sit down. Uh, I get um how much you say? Ten thousand dollars. You want a drink? Well, I don't I got a jug of whiskey. I've been saving it. <clears throat> Yeah. You say your name's uh, Dollar. What company you work for? National Life and Casualty. I get ten thousand dollars. That's right. Yeah, I have a swig. <coughs> oh my, you swallowed wrong, huh? Yeah. Oh, well, give me that. Let's see. Ah. Ah. <coughs> Well, no wonder. I didn't shake it up. Shake it up? Why, sure. <laughs> Gotta shake it to make it smooth. <laughs> you sure that didn't come with a fuse in it? Emmett Willis made it himself. Brung it by last month. Here, you try it now. Well, I really don't think oh, I... Oh, go ahead. You got a bad sample. Okay. You see how much smoother it is? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you just gotta shake it up. Now I'll have one. Yeah. <laughs> Ah, yes. Oh, my. Yeah, well, that, that's right tasty. Yeah. yeah. Let's talk about your niece. All huh? right. Let's talk. You know why anybody would want to kill her? <laughs> no, it's that fellow that's been killing all them other girls, ain't it? Yeah, I guess so. That's what the police say. Well, it seems to me he don't care who he kills. Just as long as it's a girl. <laughs> Another swig? No, no, thanks. Your niece left you when she was 16, didn't she? Yeah, I take my little you ain't it? Yeah, yeah, 17, 17, I think. She ran off to Tulsa. You see her much after yeah. that? Not much, maybe once, twice a year. When was the last time you saw her? Uh, the other day in the morgue. No, I mean before that. Yeah. Oh, my. Well, that was about a month. She didn't write, or... Oh, look, Mr. Police, they ask all them questions. I know it. You could ask them all over again, huh? If you want to get your $10,000. <laughs> well, okay. No, she didn't write. She never wrote. At least in the last five or six years, she never wrote. <laughs> when she first got to Tulsa, she used to write now and then. Last time I seen her, she didn't say nothing about what she was doing or who she was seeing or anything. So I can't very well help you find out who killed her. <laughs> Come on, have a swig. No, thanks. I'm in a rented car. Yeah, shoot yourself. Once I open the jug, it gets finished. <laughs> then you better finish it. Naturally, I will. <laughs> oh, 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 man, oh, man. Delicious, huh? Oh, you bet. <laughs> I left before he finished the damage on. It was getting dark, and he stood on the porch, leaning against a post and waving goodbye between the last few swallows. Back in Tulsa, I went to the hotel where I took a hot shower, then stretched out on the bed to relax for a few minutes before going out to dinner. I smoked a few cigarettes and had just about decided to have some food sent up to the room when the phone rang. Johnny Dollar. This is Clear. Huh? Captain Kissick. Oh, Hi. Got back from Dawson about 40 minutes ago. What'd you think of the old boy? Quite a character. Thought if you weren't doing anything, you might like to drop down to the station. You got something? Yeah, just picked up a suspect. Might be our man. What makes you think so? He was following a girl. She spotted him and got worried. When he got too close, she began screaming and he ran. She gave us a pretty good description and about 15 minutes ago, a couple of the boys picked him up. The girl identify him? Yeah, said he was the one who followed her all right. Well, it seems to me you're going to need more than that. Well, we might have him. When the boys searched him, they found a straight razor in his pocket. Coming down? Right away. (laughs) 
His name's Story. S-T-O-R-E-Y. Alvin Story. He hasn't said anything interesting. But you think he's it? Yeah, I think so. Nothing definite except the razor and his actions, but I just got a hunch. What's he say about the razor? Not much. Admits it's his. Says he was just carrying it in here. You were just taking a walk. Yes, sir. That's right. I was just taking a walk. And you weren't following the girl. I told you I wasn't. I told you I was just taking a walk. If the girl thought I was following her, well, I can't help that. I wasn't. I was just taking a walk, like I said in the first place. Hello, Captain. Hello, Alvin. Back with someone to relieve Sergeant Haddock? I'm not tired, Alvin. Well, you're going to be if you keep on like this, because I've told you the truth, and I'll just keep right on telling it all night if you keep asking me. Have a cigarette, Alvin? I told you I don't smoke. Honest, Captain, this is just a waste of time. I've told you the truth, and you're just a waste of your time with all these questions. We've got a lot of time. Now, let's go through it again, Alvin. Where did you get the razor? Well, I bought it. Where? At a hardware store. You can check it. I bought it at a hardware store about three weeks ago. I used it to shave with. Not to kill anyone. Honestly, I didn't kill anyone. I'm not the one you want. I'm not that person that killed all those women. We never said you were, Alvin. But you think so. Just because that girl thought I was following her. Oh, well, weren't you? Well, no. I told you I was not following that girl. You were on your way home. Yes. You told me before... That I was on a way to a show. Yes. I wasn't on my way home. Keep asking me all these questions. I get confused. I made a mistake. What show were you going to see? Well... Uh... What show? Oh, no one in particular. I was just going downtown to see what was playing. You were headed downtown? Yes, to see what was playing at the shows. The girl says you were following her. Well, I don't care what the girl says. She's lying. I wasn't following her. Uh, but you were walking behind her. Yes, I... I might... Yes, I was probably walking behind her. Well, she was going in the other direction from town. Well, then I wasn't behind her. I tell you, I was going... Police sergeant named Haddock kept working on the suspect, quietly, persistently. Alvin Story, a tall, frail-looking man, dressed in blue jeans and a leather jacket, sat behind the table trying desperately to be calm and anticipate the sergeant's next question. After half an hour, the captain and I left and went upstairs to his office where he fixed coffee. Cream and sugar? Black will be fine. Well, what do you think? I don't know. He's a strange one. Yeah. If I had to pick types, I don't know. It's hard to tell about anybody in a police station. Maybe he was following the girl. She starts screaming her lungs out and he panics. The law picks him up, finds a razor on him. Maybe he's not the killer at all. But he knows he looks guilty, so... He gets good and scared. Hmm. Guys act awful funny and make a lot of mistakes when they're scared. He just carries a razor around with him. Well, isn't it possible? Oh, yeah. But I still think he's our killer. Well, I have to admit I'm inclined to agree with you. But there's always a chance he's not. You never know. Kissing. Yeah. Okay. Well, we know now. Story? Yeah. He just confessed. Friends, no matter what kind of work you do, it's a real help to chew delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum right while you're working. When you're warm or tired, for instance, the lively, full-bodied spearmint flavor is really refreshing. It helps keep your mouth and throat feeling cool and moist. Chewing on that smooth, good-tasting piece of Wrigley's spearmint makes the time pass more pleasantly, too. It seems to make your work go smoother and easier. Keep a package or two of Wrigley's spearmint chewing gum handy all the time. Enjoy chewing Wrigley's spearmint while you're working and at other times. That's Wrigley's spearmint. Chewing gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. And now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Uh, 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 
Alvin Story still sat at the table in the dim, bare little room. He looked tired, but he looked relieved. A stenographer was set up at one end of the table, while Sergeant Haddock leaned against the wall and smoked a cigarette. Captain Kissig crossed to the table and sat on the edge of it, facing the suspect. Can we get this thing over with, Captain? Can we finish it up and let me go lie down? Well, the stenographer's ready. Tell us about it. Well, what's there to tell? I killed him. I killed all of them. Isn't that enough to say? That's what they'll hang me for. Anything else I say won't make any difference. Why'd you kill him, Alvin? I don't know. You know something? I really don't know. I I just wanted to. First one, I, I saw her and I just wanted to. I, I guess I thought about it before I saw her. Yes, I, I, I used to lie in bed and think about it. I used to dream about it, too. I used to wake up and feel like I'd really done it. Sick all over and scared. I felt so terrible. All like I feel now, kind of. Yeah. It's like a dream now. Right now, it's like a dream. But it isn't. Tell us about the first one. Do I have to? It'll help. What's... Kind of hard to remember exactly. I bought the razor and I waited for it. On Garvey Boulevard? I guess so. Try to remember. Yeah, it, it was Garvey. It was late at night. What night? The night of the 11th? Maybe. I, I think so. I, I think it was Tuesday night. That's right. And I killed her. You knew her? No, not really. It's hard to explain. Well, did you know any of the other three girls? Two. No, with the last one, it makes four altogether. No, three. Now, think about it a minute, Alvin. There there were... Only three. I ought to know. Three girls. No, now, now try to remember, Alvin. I don't have to try and remember anything. There were three. Just three. One, two, three. I know. Why would I want to lie? I'm not saying you're lying, Alvin. I, I, I even just... know the names. I cut the pictures out of the paper. Tell me the names, then, Alvin. Well, certainly. Mary Knapp, Virginia Vitello, and Thelma Greer. I know all of them. I, I kept a record. What about Isabel James? Who? Isabel James. Oh, yes. She was in the papers the other day. That's right. Somebody killed her like the others. I read about it. I thought it'd be blamed on me, but it didn't make any difference. One or ten, what difference would it make? <laughs> For a half hour, they questioned Alvin's story. Time and time again, he admitted the three killings, and time and time again, he denied any connection with the fourth, the murder of Isabel James. <laughs> Expense account item two, $4.95, breakfast for Captain Kissig and myself, after which I returned to the hotel and crawled into bed. A lie detector test would be given to Alvin sometime late in the afternoon, so that gave me at least six or seven hours to catch up on my sleep. I left a call at the desk, turned over, and closed my eyes. Johnny Dollar. Three o'clock, Mr. Dollar. Oh, uh-huh, thanks. And a Mr. Parrish has been waiting in the lobby to see you. Parrish? Yes, sir. Mr. Morley Parrish. He's been waiting over an hour. Okay. Send him up. Yes, sir. Come in, Mr. Parrish. Have a seat. Thank you. I've been waiting downstairs for over an hour. Oh, I'm sorry. But I was up all night. I told the desk not to disturb me until three. Oh, gee, that's all right. I know you city fellows don't like to get to bed much before the sun comes up. <laughs> I didn't mind waiting. I was with the police. Oh? I've been working with them on the death of your niece. Oh, is that right? Well, uh, that's the reason I come to Tulsa to see you. I was wondering when I was going to get the, uh, get the money. Well... <laughs> see, I got a chance to get me a right smart section of land. Trading the place I got now, plus 8000 It's a real good buy. Oh? Well, Mr. Parrish, it might be some time before you get the money. Oh, how come? 
Oh, there's a routine that has to be followed. I have to finish my investigation. You're still investigating? Oh, sure. You see, your niece's death is still unsolved. Well, is that fellow that's killing all them other girls? It certainly looks that way. You you mean you got to catch him before you can pay me? No, but I've got to make sure that he's the one who killed your niece. You think maybe he isn't? Well, to tell you the truth, Mr. Perry. Well, she got killed just like all them other girls. Not exactly. Huh? I said not exactly. You see, the razor that killed your niece and the razor that killed the other girls aren't the same. Well, how do you know that? The police laboratory report. They can tell if it was a different razor? Oh, no. Come on, Mr. Donner. Maybe I ain't the brightest. It's a fact, Mr. Parrish. How do you think they knew it was a razor in the first place? Not just a very sharp knife. Oh, they can tell, all right. Well, maybe the killer ain't using the same razor. Yeah, we've considered that, but we can't tell. He hasn't killed again. Maybe he never will. You mean I might never get my money? Well, now, Mr. Paris, it's not quite that bad. I want to see you get your money. You've certainly got it coming. But I can't honestly recommend payment to my company until the case is solved. What do you mean, until you catch the killer? That, or until we're certain the same man that killed the others killed your niece. Well, it seems to me you got to catch him to prove that. Yeah, unless he kills again, with the same razor he used on your niece. Then we can be pretty sure that he's changed razors. Well, maybe he's got uh, two different ones. He... Mm, maybe. Uh, well. You have to go? Yeah, I got to be getting back. As long as I ain't going to get the money right away, there's no sense in hanging around. Don't be discouraged, Mr. Parrish. Just as soon as I'm convinced the killer's changed razors, you'll get your money. Yeah, Dollar, we just gave Troy the polygraph test. According to our experts, Troy killed all the girls except Isabel James. Look, Captain... Morley Parrish was just in my room. I gave him a cock and bull story about his niece being killed with a different razor. A different razor? I think maybe he did it for the insurance. Read all the stories in the paper about the killings and decided to kill his niece. Uh, And then everybody just chalk it all up to Alvin's story. Right. Only I didn't tell him that Alvin's story had been arrested. Explain about that different razor. Parrish left here thinking he wasn't going to get the 10,000 until I was certain the same man killed his niece to kill the others. He thinks your police lab proved that Isabel James was killed with another razor. And he quickly came up with a solution that the killer had changed razors or had two of them. So what? I think he'll go out and prove it. What? You mean you think... I think he's simple-minded enough to try and kill someone just to make it look like the killer has changed razors. Well, I sure hope you're wrong. Well, so do I, but it's the only way we could prove anything. Where is he? He just left. But holy cow, if you're right and he's wandering around... Relax. He'll go back to his farm in Dawson first. What makes you think so? He has to get the razor, doesn't he? Ten minutes later, Captain Kissig picked me up in his car and we drove well over the speed limit getting to Dawson. Just west of old Morley's farm, we pulled off the road and turned off our lights. Well, the house is dark. Where is he? Still on his way from Tulsa. We got here pretty fast, Captain. Yeah, we did, didn't we? Come on. Let's walk down to the house. He have a car? I don't know, but I doubt it. I didn't see one the last time I was here. Dollar? Hmm? What if you're wrong? What if you've guessed wrong? What if he did have the razor on him? Well... That's a pretty good question. The night was warm with a big red moon. We walked down to the old farmhouse while a coyote howled way off in the distance. We found a spot by the side of the house where we could see the road and still be hidden in the shadows. We waited for Morley Parrish to come and get his razor. About an hour later, the old man came walking down the road and went into the house. After a few moments, a light flared in the back room. We could hear him moving around, then the light went out. Oh, 
Hold it. Who's there? Who are you? It's me, Mr. Parrish. Mr. Dollar? Yeah. This is Captain Kissig with me. Uh, what do you want? Just came down to see you. Well, I got business. I got to be going. In a minute. Well, there's a drink in the house, another jug behind the stove. Go on in and make yourself comfortable. <laughs> I'll be right back. Hey, just a minute, Mr. Well, Parrish. Look, I got to hurry. Where are you going? I got business uh, in Dawson. You going to walk? Oh, sure. I always walk. <laughs> I hitchhike if I get a lift. We've got a car. We'll give you a lift. No, I don't want to put you in no trouble. No trouble. Mr. Parrish, what did you pick up in the house? Huh? What? Well, nothing. I... What have you got in your pocket? Well, nothing. Uh, no, what do you want? You ain't got no right to do... Do you own a straight razor, Mr. Parrish? You better give it to us, Mr. Parrish. And be careful how you do it. I've got a gun pointed at you. Well, you knew it all the time, huh? I had a hunch. Uh, now, here you are. Hmm. Is this the one you killed your niece with? Yeah. You were going to kill somebody else. Oh, there ain't no difference after the first one. and I sure could have used that money. Gee. Man, oh, man, that was a wonderful little farm, but I... Oh, I just guess you can't beat them scientific police methods. <laughs> I sure thought I had it all figured out, too. Gee, I was... Oh, we going to go now? Yeah. What's going to happen to my farm? They'll sure hang me, and I ain't got no relatives the to take care of. The state will take care of it. Come on. Mm. Mr. Dollar. Hmm? Why don't you just sneak back later on, get that jug? There's no sense in wasting it on some stranger who wouldn't appreciate it. We took old Morley Parrish back to the station where he gave us a complete confession. He'd killed his niece for the insurance the way I'd figured. When we told him that Alvin's story had confessed that afternoon, old Morley just shook his head and said something about policemen being a whole lot smarter than most folks give him credit for. Expense account item three, $11.80, dinner for me and Captain Kissick. After which I returned to my hotel, turned in and got a good night's sleep. Expense account... Items four and five, $89.45 car rental and hotel bill. Item six, $125.19 plane fare and incidentals back to Hartford. Expense account total, $335.04. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, for refreshing taste plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. The taste of fresh spearmint is cooling and delightful, and there's lots of it in every stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. It freshens your mouth, helps keep your throat moist, and sweetens your breath besides. You'll enjoy the good chewing, too, because Wrigley's Spearmint is so smooth and pleasant to chew on. There's nothing else quite like it. Next time you're at the store, stop at your friendly merchant's display of chewing gum and get a few packages of good-tasting Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Always keep some handy for refreshing taste plus chewing enjoyment. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. <laughs> Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brought to you by Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were Joe Duvall, Parley Bear, Howard McNear, and Clayton Post. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. The makers of Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley Spearmint Gum every day. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at this same time when from Hollywood, John Lund returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> 
This is the CBS Radio Network. Welcome back. Well, this does go back to an email we received a few weeks back about why the insurance company would send Johnny out when it appears the insured had nothing to do with it. In this case, it appeared that uh, Isabel James was murdered as part of an ongoing uh, chain of serial killings. However, you don't know until you actually do the investigating. Uh, and, of course, we get a uh, great Howard McNear character, which is always uh, a highlight of Johnny Dollar, both in this era and the Bailey era. Well, listener comments and feedback now, and I have a comment here from uh, Denise. And uh, this one is regarding the voodoo matter. And she writes, I was expecting Adam to mention this was a reuse with minor revisions of the Richard Diamond Little Chiva episode from 1951, uh, episode 2357 of this podcast. Did uh, Jester Hairston also play Little Chiva in the Richard Diamond version? I think it was the distinctive voice that made me think of that episode when listening to this one, so I'll be surprised if it was not the same actor reprising the same role, albeit with a different character name. Such a great voice and worth listening to the story uh, in two different shows to hear again. Well, thanks for the comment, Denise. I, I will say that I did feel like I'd heard a story like this before, but uh, Haiti episodes are kind of tricky. Now, obviously, there is the thing where we won't necessarily recognize every instance of script reuse, because there are so many episodes, you can't keep them all straight. But this one, I did have a feeling that it was somewhat familiar. But when I looked through a log with description, there was only one reference to a Haiti episode. But I think there were actually two different Richard Diamond Haiti episodes. In addition, there are some... Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Haiti episodes. I think there was one that was done during the Russell era that was again done during the O'Brien era. And there was another Richard Diamond episode set in Haiti that was also adapted to Johnny Dollar. So it was kind of hard to locate. I could not find the name, and I couldn't find it when I went to Radio Gold Index and looked under uh, Jester Hairston in there. Uh, listening to the Richard Diamond episode, uh, the recording that's in circulation doesn't appear to have full credits, which I think is why it didn't show up in Hairston's uh, radiography. But taking a quick listen, I do think the voice was his. Denise continues, The changes were minor, This, but this was a case of it working better. In my estimation, in the revision, the more open ending in the Johnny Dollar version was creepier even with the subtle implication that Johnny knew who killed the bad guy and that it was not Bimba as a zombie, but was letting the voodoo zombie explanation stand so the man who saved him didn't get investigated in connection with the death. It should have been considered justifiable homicide anyway, given the bad guy was armed and about to kill Johnny and an officer of the law, but I can understand why a grateful Johnny would want to shield the man who saved his life. On the comments the end, I agree with the listener, about being confused why the insurance company had any reason to send an insurance investigator, in some cases including the Black Doll matter. I could rationalize the insurance company interest, however, in the voodoo matter, in continuing to investigate even after the insured died, especially given that Johnny had already traveled to Haiti on the company dime by the time the insured died. It sounds like the suspected bad guy was wealthy, and that Johnny found sufficient evidence for a lawsuit against the bad guy's estate concerning damages related to his arson and the cattle killing, and possibly the wrongful deaths. I don't know about Haiti, but in my jurisdiction, an insurance company is entitled to reimbursement from the recovery from the offender, or in this fictional case, the offender's estate in such a lawsuit. Well, that's a great point, and insurance companies really... 
uh, they do want to find ways to recover funds, however that might be. And there are different states in the United States where anyone who is financially harmed by a death can file a long, wrongful death lawsuit. And that can be a way for an insurance company to try to recover some of the money it uh, put out. Because yeah, that is one of the big goals, and that's their way. They're trying to mitigate any losses. Obviously, they have to be careful about that. In this week's case, for example, if it had turned out that the same serial killer who had killed the other women also had been behind uh, the death of the insured woman, there probably wasn't a whole lot that they could uh, do about it. The serial killer would not have an estate that was worth suing. But in this case, as the insured did it, they were able to find a way out of it anyway. Uh, and, of course, we have had episodes where Johnny has kind of taken some preventative step, where the insurance company becomes aware, due to some local knowledge, that a loss is likely and Johnny steps in to prevent it, or he will step in to prevent the insurance company losing more money by a string of crimes continuing. So, obviously, there are a lot of reasons why an insurance company could call in Johnny Dollar and profit by it, or at least have a good chance of profiting by it. And as Denise points out that in the voodoo uh, matter... Uh, that there were significant losses to multiple farms, it was probably uh, worth it to the insurance company in that case. So, thanks so much for the comment. Definitely appreciate it, Christine. And then we also have a comment from Eric uh, regarding the Frank Graham, Paul Dubov uh, episodes we just uh, concluded. Eric writes, I've enjoyed this run of Jeff Regan. I think... What I'll miss most is getting to listen to the incomparable Frank Nelson every week. It's been a real treat. Well, thanks so much, Eric. It definitely was. Well, now it is time to thank our Patreon supporter of the day. Thank you to Lauren, Patreon supporter since September, currently supporting us at the Master Detective level of $15 or more per month. Again, thanks so much for your support. And that will do it for today. If you are enjoying this podcast, be sure to rate and review it wherever you get your, your podcast from. We'll be back next Friday, another episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. But coming up tomorrow, we join Jace Pearson for another of Tales of the Texas Rangers, where... 10, 20, 30, 40, 50... What the... Joseph. Well, what's happened to the lights? I'm not through back here. Well, I didn't turn them off, Ma. One of the fuses must have blown. Hey, did you think it could be the refrigerator again? No, I just put in a whole new unit, didn't I? Hey, you just stay where you are, Claire. I'll get my flashlight here and see what the trouble is. Be careful, Joseph. <laughs> and don't worry, honey. I'll be careful. Yeah, let's see what we got here now. Yeah, all these fuses look good. Joseph? Everything seems all right in here, Ma. Must be in the main switch box. I'll take a look outside. Well, I'll be done. Main switch is pulled. Oh, who in thunder... Oh, everything's huh? Keep your back to me and give me a flashlight. What? Who are you? Never mind. Now, hold up. Uh, Nobody's going to hold up Joe Barry. I saw you all fool. Oh, oh fool. Didn't you find the trouble, Joseph? <laughs> Joseph? Joseph, what on earth are you doing trying to count up here with so little? No, no, Joseph. What are you doing? Keep away, old woman. Joseph! Get away from that cash register! Shut up! <laughs> Crazy old bat. I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.